Hey, I'm recording this since I'm doubling it up for those that are not here, um, because otherwise they'd have to watch two hour plus long videos. So let me pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen, Lord Jesus. Thank you for bringing us together here tonight, um, gathering in fellowship um, and the, for the meal that we had together. We ask that you send angels of sufficient rank, number, power, and authority to fight any evil off and away from us and put a perimeter of protection around us. We ask that you give us understanding as we learn about one of the seven sacraments, the anointing of the sick. Um, we ask for the intercession of Our Lady as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So I'm a PowerPoint person. I do find, kind of find that boring. So I hope you guys are okay with that. But it helps me remember everything I'm supposed to teach. Um, anointing of the sick is one of the seven sacraments, and it is a sacrament of healing, just like confession is a sacrament of healing. So we had baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist are known as sacraments of initiation, and confession and anointing of the sick are known as sacraments of healing. Um, and you see, I've got Jesus with the little girl that he... They also did that in the chosen. That was really good too. So, um, and let's see. Okay. So, and this comes straight out of the catechism, um, by the sacred anointing of the sick and the prayer of the priests, the whole church commends those who are ill to the suffering and glorified Lord, that he may raise them up and save them. And indeed, she exhorts them to contribute to the good of the people of God by freely uniting themselves to the passion and death of Christ. Anointing of the sick strengthens those who are ill or dying. The sacrament calls, Christ calls Christians to accept and welcome suffering and faith as, their es as essential to their own growth in sanctity and to the body of Christ. So um, this is a a sacrament of healing. And, and I think in the next slide, I talk about how it can bring physical or it's probably further along. It, it can bring physical healing. Um, cause obviously we know Jesus, uh, you know, physically healed people, but what he was looking to do was to let you know, like suffering is not the worst thing in our life. Sin is the worst thing in our life. And so he gives us something to do with our suffering. Um, and we can unite our suffering with his and that the anointing of the sick brings like this healing of your spirit, even as you're dying. Um, and, uh, it can, it can bring physical healing. I, did you all know father Fred, yeah. Like Father Fred was hilarious. He he retired and he's up in Michigan, but he used to talk about I would go and I'd see Bob and he was on death's door and he was gonna die any second and I'd, I'd anoint him and I'd see him at the grocery store the next week, you know. <laughs> and so there are there is efficacious like physical healing that that can happen from this um from this, but let me get to the you know the rest of the slides. So um yeah right I mean he was hilarious uh, he just he just yeah he was always like very um I hate people but I'm compelled to love them you know like it was just so funny to listen to him but um so there is a divine care for our well-being um our spiritual our emotional well-being but also our physical well-being it's not as though the body doesn't matter to god he gave us the body so it matters to god um and i talk about isaiah here the suffering ser servant who heals us by his wounds so that was prophesied in isaiah interestingly enough i found out that the jews actually removed isaiah 53 from their scriptures which talks about the suffering servants so they go from like 52 to 54 in the chapters and it's the whole verse on jesus is at least that's what the internet said um so i was like oh wow and this guy 
was going around Israel and being like, have you ever read Isaiah 53 and to the Jews? And they were like, no. And that he read it to him and they're like, he's like, do you know anyone that fits that description? And they, some of them were like Jesus. And some of them were like, nope, <laughs> I don't know anybody. And so it was interesting. But if you ever want to read the prophecy of Isaiah, um, that it's like starts at the uh, big, like, 13 of 52 and then all the way through 53 is the suffering servant and it talks about a man of sorrows um hated by many and all of that that it's his suffering for us that shows his divine care for our well-being the father's mercy and never-ending love are fully re revealed in Jesus who is the divine physician um Jesus came as the divine physician to heal sinners, which all of us are, all fall short of the glory of God. Um, and I've put the Bible verses here if anybody wants to write them down and look them up. Um, but because we're going to learn about purgatory too, we're not looking them up. So Jesus came to heal the blind, the deaf, the sick, and the afflicted. Um, Luke tells us that. And Jesus sent his apostles out to preach and to heal. So uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church in 1500, that paragraph number, illness and suffering has always been among the gravest problems confronted in human life. In illness, man experiences his powerlessness, his limitations, and his finitude. Every illness can make us glimpse death. Um, I would also say, cause I had a conversation with someone today about poverty, like poverty does that too. And I think that's why like poverty makes you feel powerless, limited, and very finite in what you're able to do. And, um, Jesus in the Beatitudes, which was that last week's readings, it's blessed are the poor and blessed are the poor in spirit. So it's like the poor are humbled. The poor in spirit are, are humbled people. Um, that's two different gospels. One says blessed are the poor. The other says blessed are the poor in spirit, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, illness does it too. And illness can do it to the wealthy, right? Cause you can be as rich as can be and you're still not immortal. Um, you might have access to all the healthcare, but you still could die. Uh, Steve Jobs taught us that, right? And so um, a lot, of, you know, illness can lead to anguish. So can poverty, self-absorption, sometimes even despair and revolt against God. It can also make a person more mature helping him discern in his life what is not essential so that he can turn toward that which is essential. Very often, illness provokes a search for God and a return to him. So illness in this way that like all of us can suffer from this if we were called to love, right? So we can become bitter and angry through illness or we can become like a suffering servant like Christ and unite that suffering to him um to get and it gives purpose to the suffering the divine care for our well-being con will continue with the catechism of the catholic church 1502 the man of the old testament lives his sickness in the presence of god it is before god that he laments his illness and it is of God, master of life and death, that he implores healing. Illness becomes a way to conversion. God's forgiveness initiates the healing. It is the experience of Israel that illness is mysteriously linked to sin and evil. So we know that because illness came into the world because of sin and evil. Um, it wouldn't have been like that if if Adam and Eve hadn't fallen. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody that gets sick, it's because of their personal sin, but there's a, there is a mysterious link between those two things. Um, it says, faithfulness to God, according to his law, restores life, for I am the Lord, your healer. The prophet intuits that suffering can also have a redemptive meaning for the sins of others. 
Finally, Isaiah announces that God will usher in a time for Zion when he will pardon every offense and heal every illness. So that's like the end of time, resurrection of the body. Your body gets resurrected, whether you're in hell or in heaven, and it's going to look awful in hell. It's going to be glorified in heaven. Um, and remember, we choose, we choose where we go by our we're, we're judged by our works. Um, grace saves us, but we're judged by our works. So if you can keep the perspective that when an illness comes your way, that you you praying, just praying, like I, I accept that this is here, that's one thing, instead of fighting against it. And then um I offer this back, the suffering and love to save other souls. That's called redemptive suffering. I'll talk about that at a little in a little bit, but that's what Jesus did. That's what he did on the cross. He took on suffering. It wasn't an illness the way that we have like cancer and stuff, but he took on suffering to save our souls. And so when we can have that perspective in our illness and um, look up and have gratitude instead of down and bitterness, it transforms the illness into something beautiful. I'm trying to learn that with my mom currently. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Christ is the physician, Christ's compassion toward the sick, and his many healings of every kind of infirmity are a splendid sign that God has visited his people and that the kingdom of God is close at hand. Jesus has the power not only to heal, but also to forgive sins. You guys remember in the story of the paralytic where the friends like lower him into the house and he's in front of the Pharisees and he knows what they're thinking. And he says, is it easier to say, I forgive your sins or get up and walk? And the paralytic gets up and walks. But that's he was stating like, I'm God, I can forgive sins. Um, and healing is directly linked to forgiveness. Um and that's not to say that like you would be healed every time that you forgive, but if you have like harbor grudges against other people, it actually affects your physical body. Um, so, and that's not to say that's the only reason you get sick either, but that's just one of the things when I've worked in um, healing ministries where you pray over people. And one of the first things that you ask is like, do you forgive those who have harmed you? And are you sorry for your sins? It's all tied together. Our physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being, they're all tied together. Um, he has come to heal the whole man, soul, and body. He is the physician the sick have need of. His compassion toward all who suffer goes so far that he identifies himself with them. I was sick and you visited me. So you remember that that whole scripture passage when what you did to the least of my brother and you did it to me. So he's identifying with that. His preferential love for the sick has not ceased through the centuries to draw the very special attention of Christians towards all those who suffer in body and soul. It is the source of tireless efforts to comfort them. And you'll see this with the Catholic saints, the lives of the Catholic saints. Um, a lot of them were sick um, and they prayed in their sickness, but you'll also see that a lot of them started hospitals. That's where the hospital systems came from. Um, Padre Pio started a hospital system in San Giovanni Rotundo and like St. Thomas, we have downtown. It's like the Catholic, the Catholic hospital. So that hospital system was created by the Catholics to care for the sick. Often Jesus asks the sick to believe. He makes use of signs to heal, spittle and laying on of hands, mud and washing. The sick tried to touch him for power came forth from him and healed them all. And so in the sacraments, Christ continues to touch us in order to heal us. 
So remember when a sacrament is performed, except for marriage, what we'll talk about next week, it's usually the priest that's conferring the sacrament. Um, in marriage, it's the husband and wife conferring it on one another, but usually it's the priest um, that is conferring the sacrament. The priest is the witness to the marriage and the sacrament is the the covenant between the husband and the wife. So that we'll get into next week. But so these priests, when they are put on that stole and that chasuble and they perform these sacraments, it's as if Christ is doing it to you, to you himself. Um, I have been present with priests when they laid hands on people and anointed them and they got better. So it's real. It still happens. It wasn't just 2000 years ago. Um <laughs> Moved by so much suffering, Christ not only allows himself to be touched by the sick, but he makes their miseries his own. He took on our infirmities and bore our diseases. That's back to that Isaiah passage. But he did not heal all of the sick. His healings were signs of the coming of the kingdom of God. They announced more radical healing, the victory over sin and death through his Passover. So the ultimate healing is that healing where we're purified of sin. Um, and that can happen okay. even if our physical body dies, we end up in heaven and that's like the ultimate healing. Um, on the cross, Christ took upon himself the whole weight of evil and took away the sin of the world of which illness is only a consequence. By his passion and death on the cross, Christ has given a new meaning to suffering. It can henceforth configure us to him and unite us with his redemptive passion. Heal the sick. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Quiet people. Um, oops. Okay, so remember whenever there's a sacrament, there's a matter and form of how, you know, the matter is the Eucharist, the form is the words of consecration and baptism, um, it's the, the water is the matter and the form is the, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So um, we'll get into that here. The the so Jansen talked about this last week in regards to confession, and it's true also of anointing of the sick. This passage from James 5:14: Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders or presbyters, priests of the church, and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Um, and so this is where with the oil part we get that's the matter of anointing of the sick that's what's going to be used in the sacrament um, and the priest anoints the forehead of the sick person and the hands of the sick person um, and that that oil um, is they bless oil every year at the chrism mass and so there we have the oils downstairs there's different kinds of oils but the oil of the sick is is one of them um, the sacrament of anointing of the sick is given to those who are seriously ill by anointing them on the forehead and hands with the duly blessed oil pressed from olives or other plants and saying only once through this holy anointing. So here we go with the form, right? Through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from sin, save you and raise you up. Okay. I have a picture there. That's Father Bolster with my mom in the hospital. So that was February of 2021. My mom fell and broke her hip I was positive she was gonna die and she didn't she is and I, I I have no doubt that there was healing that took place here and that she was able to leave the hospital in part because of this and the grace from this but also you know the people in the hospital taking good care of her the physician there came in and prayed over my mom and prayed for his own hands to be guided in the surgery and I was like, okay, we're good, <laughs> you know? So if you're having surgery. Yeah, so if you're having surgery, so, and we'll talk about, um, you know, that this is, 
the sacrament, so I, I'll talk about it here. It confers sac sanctifying grace, strengthening courage, healing of the soul, and sometimes of the body. Um, consecrates the one receiving it to be united to Jesus's suffering, um, which then makes it glorified, right? Which means that that there will be good fruit that comes out of it. It can be given for serious illness as well as those expected to die soon and surgery um, before surgeries because surgery, you're always taking that risk that something could happen. Uh, we have pregnant women that come in all the time before they're going to deliver and they're like, will you anoint me? Um, there's, you know, it can be for mental health as well. If it's severe, like a severe issue with mental health, where you would worry about their life being in danger, you can ask for anointing of the sick when it, it, the old terminology for it, when it's given at, um, given for like time of death is called extreme unction. Uh, this is also, this is my mom and my dad, and that's Father Rehill, who is the diocesan exorcist. And so he, he didn't, he wasn't exercising them. He was anointing them. They weren't possessed. They were sick. Um, and so, uh, Very important distinction. right. <laughs> Just thought, you know, but, um, and I, I can tell you that he's the exorcist because he has it like on his website. It says that he is some, some of them don't say that they are so, but he does. So, uh, during a person's lifetime, it can be given as many times as deemed necessary. My dad used to crack me up. My dad had like back surgery. I had to drive him to St. Louis, uh, it's 2017 and, I'm a weirdo. I like to go to different churches and I'm like, we're going to go to this church and we're going to go to this church. Um, and they had that big basilica in St. Oh, Louis yeah. that is, so, anyway, there were like priests everywhere. And I was like, my dad's having surgery. Will you pray for him? And they're, they'd be like, well, let me anoint him. And like, he got anointed. Like, and he's like, yes, he got anointed. I was like, I think you're being a sacrament hog, like one is enough. And I'm like, I'm not sure, like, you know, if, uh, if he should have done that, but cause one time would be enough, but every time a priest offered, he said, yes, because we were, you know, I was asking for prayers, but so it can be given as many, to, and he came through that surgery fine, by the way. And, um, it did help a little, um, the surgery did, but my dad was, my dad loved the church and my dad loved the sacraments. He was a very good father. Um, and, Anyway, I was blessed to have him as my dad. Um, and he passed away on July 16th of 2021, which is the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which means a lot to me. Um, and he was anointed nine days before that. And I look at that nine days as like a novena of days or like the nine choirs of angels. So it like I felt okay. And we'll, we'll talk about purgatory like after this. Um, I, but because he was anointed, anointing of the sick, like do I talk about anointing of the sick typically um, comes with if they're alert and awake, you get and they're so here if they're about to die, but they're alert and awake, they give what's called viaticum, which is the reception of the Eucharist for the last time that accompanies them in their passing over to eternal life. Prayers for the sick and dying are often offered. Sustaining prayers for the sick and dying person and the family calls upon God's mercy and peace. There we are again. That was Father Nick with my mom and dad on the back porch. And just keeping in mind two years, they my mom's been living with me and my dad. My dad was only with us for five months in my house. Um, and then under appropriate circumstances, there's something called an apostolic pardon, which is given to grant full pardon and remission of sins for the dying persons. It's a plenary indulgence. Okay. When I talk about purgatory after this, we'll kind of get into that. But anointing of the sick, you're typically receiving confession. You're receiving, if you're dying, you receive the viaticum, the Eucharist, and then you get the anointing itself. Um, when you go to confession, you are forgiven totally for your sins, but the temporal consequence of your sin is still there. 
So if you think of that, and, and when I talk about this in terms of like purgatory, you'll, you'll get more of an understanding. But if you think about it in terms of like, if there were a husband and a wife, and let's say the husband cheated on the wife, the wife can forgive him, right? And they can stay together. But do you think there'll be consequences in the relationship from that cheating? Will there be a lack of trust and, and a rebuilding that has to take place, a repair that has to take place? So all sin is like that. And some sin, the repair is minor, but some sin, the repair is major. And so that's where purgatory comes in. If you've confessed and you're forgiven, but you, you still have the temporal consequences of the sin that need repairing and this apostolic pardon what it does and so you you have to think of that in spiritual terms like when you commit a sin there's kind of this spiritual you know consequence that goes out from you to the rest of the body this is why I would, last week when we talked about confession when you go to the priest it's like you're confessing to god but you're also confessing to the church and making yourself reconciled to the church so um that reconciliation is a larger uh, uh more all-encompassing thing and which is why it's sacramental and ha- there's so much grace in it and so the repair of it is is the second part, which is when you get a penance for confessing those sins and you're doing your penance, you're repairing for those temporal consequences. Well, if you confess, confess at your anointing and they know you're going to die, they're not going to hand these out namby-pamby, just so you know. Um, you can get an apostolic pardon and see my father did not get one because he we weren't sure that he was like he didn't die till nine days later so he had so that's where you think about would he have time and time which is such a weird thing to say when you're talking about the eternal but like we think of it in our limited way like would he have time in purgatory which I'll talk about but my mom has actually had an apostolic pardon because she is not able to reason anymore um her like ability is that of like a two-year-old I'm definitely dealing with a toddler we have very weird and dark morbid funny conversations (laughs) so um I I hopefully you guys can laugh at this I'm not telling this to like make anybody feel bad but like for the 150th time two days ago my mom was like where's my dad where's my dad where's my dad where's my dad and and I'm like this is I'm in this middle of this mess and I finally was like he's dead he died in 1962. I never met him. And then she looks at me and she goes, you're crazy. And I was like, I, and I said, I am, but not for why you think I am, but yes, I am crazy because, and it's like, you have to find the humor in it. It seems like I have to, I have to make a joke out of it, but the point being is she does not have the ability to reason at all anymore. And so because of that, she is like a toddler. And so my cousin is a priest. He's another, he's probably in one of these pictures somewhere, maybe not, I don't know. But my cousin is a priest. And I was like, can she have an apostolic pardon now? Because she can't commit sin anymore. She's not able to, because she can't reason. And he was like, and, um, and because of her type one diabetes, she's had two strokes. And at the time she it didn't look good. He was like, yeah, I can give her an apostolic part. And we thought she might die some point right after he left. And then he anointed her and she got better. <laughs> <laughs> so it does work. Um, but she's, she's had that apostolic pardon. So I feel like if my mom passed, she's good. She's good to go. Um, and This last slide is a little bit about redemptive suffering. We will go way more into this um, in in the class on redemptive suffering, but sin and suffering are both evils in our daily experience, but but sin, not suffering, is the worst evil. Sin and sickness cause spiritual, physical, and emotional disturbance that can often lead to sorrow and bitterness, discouragement, and lack of hope sacraments give hope. 
Jesus did not come to banish suffering in this life. He didn't say, you know, I came to banish suffering. He said, I came to destroy the works of the devil. That's one John 10, 10. So the works of the devil is getting us to sin. Um, but he did give suffering meaning and he invested it with redemptive power. Through redemptive suffering, we are given dignity to share in Jesus' Jesus is suffering for the sake of the church. So I remember, I'm going to pause here for a second too. Um, my father had back pain forever. And then it turns out that part of his back pain ended up, it was because of his heart. And he was like in heart failure. Um, they found that out. They were going to do prep him for back surgery. And they discovered he needed a quadruple bypass. Um, so there was a lot of suffering on my father and he asked me for a list of people to pray for. That makes me cry. <laughs> Sorry. And he would, if I gave him your name, he was saying it out loud every night for his suffering to be offered for you. Um, and it like, it gave purpose to that suffering and it gets you out. Like when you're suffering, you get you can get despairing and depressed and have anxiety, but it like what Christ does is he's like, look up at me and look out at these other people. And when you're looking up, did y'all know if you look up, you can't cry? <laughs> like physically, it's like the tears stop if you look up. And so he's having you look outside yourself. That is true love. When you're like looking upon God and others more than you're looking at yourself and your own suffering and so and we're human it's really hard I mean like every day when my mom asked me for the 150th time and there are times that I'm like how long Lord but every day that I can love her and not get frustrated and be like he's dead you know or whatever it is like is a, is a moment of grace and I don't think that I'll ever regret you know taking on that suffering of caring for her and I know she did it for me when I was little and so so the next line is suffering is a necessary purification and like I've especially 2022 uh, 2021 it started when my dad died and then I don't want to make it a whole litany of all my sufferings but last year was really hard and I could see like through all of it. And when you're in the middle of it, you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, stop, please stop. But um, it's usually in hindsight, like I can see how much like pride I had um, where I thought about myself all the time. And I wasn't, I wasn't thinking like about all the people that were around me and or like at the things that they were going through. And when I would come through, especially that back injury, and I came across some young people that were in car wrecks and they had a lot of physical pain. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I never knew that about you. And like, I wasn't paying attention because I was so wrapped up in my own stuff. It just gets you outside of yourself. So it's this purification like that that's the goal. The purification is like, there's no selfish desire in you anymore. Right. Um, and maybe at the end of my life or your lives, you'll come to that. So I, John Bosco was like, when you get purified, then you die. You know, he said he was like, always like at the end of your life there. Um, if you're striving for sainthood, which we all should be, but it's necessary for holiness. It's a primary tool of the soul, Holy Spirit to configure us to Christ. Um, and, you know, I, I even with my mom and her dementia, it's like, like she yells at me and tells me I'm crazy. I'm like taking care of her and loving her. I'm just trying to love you. I just want to love you. I'm just trying to love you. And she's like, you're crazy. You're keeping me entrapped. I'm in prison. I can't get out of this place, you know? And I'm like, ah, oh, that must be how God feels about us, hmm. right? We're looking at our, our life through a demented lens and we blame God for our suffering when he's just trying to love us. And, and the rules that he gives us are just out of love to try to like keep us on that path of love, 
right? And so it, but it, you know, it's I, I was selfish, y'all. And it's like when you um when you have this opportunity, if you can view the suffering from that lens, it makes it so much easier. Suffering with love provides immeasurable benefits to the body of Christ. By performing corporal and spiritual works of mercy, we imitate Jesus, the healer, and become more fully transformed in him by the power of the spirit. So that's the last slide I have for anointing of the sick. This sacrament is about bringing hope and healing to our suffering um, definitely spiritual healing, hopefully physical healing. And like I said, I definitely have seen that. I, I really do think my mom, I'm like, oh Lord, she, you know, she'll be tanking, 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 and a priest will give her anointing of the sick and she gets better. And I'm like, okay. Um, and I, I think that's beautiful, you know, um, can someone who is not Catholic receive the anointing of the sick? Um, the, the sacraments are reserved for people who are Catholic, but I, I think it's one of those like falls in the mercy category of like a pre what you could talk to a priest and see if he would do it. Um, most of them that I know would, would anoint, but it not in the sacramental formula. So they're praying a prayer with a sacramental over people that are not Catholic to help bring them healing, but they, but they don't perform the sacrament because the sacraments are when you, when you partake in a sacrament, it's like, it's because you're part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And you are stating, like, I believe what this church believes. And so we want people, you know, to take the sacraments seriously, like for their, their, it's not, a, it's not an exclusion thing. It's a, it's like a, we want you to understand what this is. Well, my mom had to mention she, she yeah. can't speak. Yeah. So she could not. She wouldn't even be able to say. So like, cause there are people that are in, you know, I had a friend uh, several years back Eva. she had pancreatic cancer and she, she died on the table and they revived her. And she's like, I want to be Catholic. Like now and father bala drove out to the hospital and she became catholic and he performed all of the sacraments like right there she didn't have to go through rcia <laughs> right um because she was in danger of death and she had she actually told me that um when she, she was like i was dead and i she's like i didn't see anything and i didn't hear anything but i had this like understandable knowing that it's all about forgiveness and that we need to like be reconciled with our loved ones and love them as best as we can while we're here. And, um, and I was like, uh-huh, that's right. And I'm like Catholic religion right there. Wham. You know, like that's, that's Matthew 8, 18, the un, um, unmerciful servant. Like if you don't forgive the way I forgive you, you're the one that's tortured. Right. And so, um, and, but the sac, so understand that like you and I, as humans, if we have a rift or a falling out or a, it's like impossible for us to love like God loves, unless we have God. Right. And so that's where the grace comes from. That's where the sacraments come in. Nothing is impossible for God because you're like essentially handing over my human will, which says eye for an eye. And you're asking to be filled with the divine will. That's what the sacraments, that's what you're asking for, is to be filled with the divine will. Um, if you're properly disposed, there are a lot of Catholics in the pew that don't know this. They don't practice this. But if you're properly disposed and you're like, I just want to be filled with you, what we have is physical presence in the Eucharist. We have his reconciliation in the confessional. We've got his anointing when we're sick. There's and there's just real efficacious sanctifying grace that comes from that that helps your soul get purified and you you become the scripture calls it divinization you don't become god but you become filled with god that enables you to love other people how you're supposed to i can tell you and it's a pathway it's a journey i've talked about this before it doesn't happen instantaneously but 
I mean, 10 years ago, I would have been like, yep, you're going to nursing home. See you later. Cause I wouldn't, I wasn't in a place spiritually where I could handle what's happening in my house now. Um, and the Lord knows what he's doing and he knows the best way to purify you. And sometimes it's through illness and things like that. Um, all right, let me exit out of this and go over to let's learn about purgatory now. <laughs> any, any other questions? Is it, is it heavy enough for you? <laughs> are you? It's a lot. It's a lot to take in. So probably um, aside from Mary and her doctrines, the most misunderstood doctrine of the Catholic Church is purgatory and what it is. Um, so I, I sort of explained it to you guys about the there's a temporal uh, consequence to your sin. And I explained that about uh, adultery and all how that would like you would still have to repair that rift. Um, but I'll start with the catechism here. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. So you have to like, heaven is a place, but you it's also a state of being. So when, when Jesus said, I am, it's like he's everywhere. He permeates everything. He holds everything together in his will. And he's also all love. Perfect love, perfect perfection. Like that, that's heaven that place that we go to where perfect love is. So anything that's still attached to us, any consequence that we still have can't be in heaven. So it has to go somewhere and we can do our purgatory here on earth through redemptive suffering or after we die, it's actually God's greatest mercy. But you have to think of it in terms of Nothing imperfect can be in heaven looking at the face of God. It's like it wouldn't be able to stand it. Um, so we use, uh, and I'll get to like reading this, we use analogies all the time, um, like the goldsmith who is who is refining the gold and getting the impurity out of it. He burns it in a fire right? To melt that gold and make it into something beautiful, like a gold ring or whatever. We don't make gold rings that have all the dirt and muck and everything stuck inside of it. So if you want a perfect looking gold ring, you're going to refine it in a fire. And so that's why it's, it's like this, this, those things that separate you from, from being able to be in perfection. So the church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the church, by reference to certain texts of scripture, speaks of a cleansing fire. Are you going to find the word purgatory in scripture? No. Are you going to find the word purification in scripture? Everywhere, all over the place. It's just Latin for, and scripture wasn't written in Latin. It's the Latin word for purification. Um, as for certain lesser faults, we must believe that before the final ju judgment, there is a purifying fire. He who is truth says that whoever utters blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will be pardoned neither in this age nor the age to come. So that's scriptural. And from this sentence, we understand that certain offenses can be forgiven in this age, but certain others in the age to come. So even if you have sin on your soul, as long as it's not mortal sin, 
you can still make it to purgatory. Let's remember the difference between mortal sin and venial sin. So mortal sin, it's a grave matter. You know, it's a grave matter. You give your full consent. Mortal sin is like, screw you, God. I don't care what you have to say. I'm going to do it anyway, because it feels good. And I'm um, venial sin. Like it, it can be a venial sin if like you don't know, or there's an impediment, like if something grave is going on, but you were never taught, then it's like, it doesn't meet that definition of mortal sin. But venial sin is also the little white lies you told to not hurt somebody's feelings. Your intention was good, but you lied. Um, There, you know, we do classify the offenses like that. So even if you died with this venial sin on your soul, you can make it to purgatory understand it's a choice these are all choices you make right so you make a choice to mortally sin you make a choice in venial sin you make a choice to confess to turn to god to take it all to god the teaching is based on the practice of prayer for the dead already mentioned in sacred scripture this is one of those books that martin luther removed it's the book of maccabees um, but this line is from that. Therefore, Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sins. So the Jews were making atonement for dead people. They were also praying for them. From the beginning of the church, from the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead and offered prayers and suffrage for them. Above all, the Eucharistic sacrifice, so that, thus purified, they may attain the beatific vision of God. The church also commends all almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. So one of the greatest, one of the biggest sorrows that I see is that uh, from Protestantism is they're not praying for their dead, and their dead could be in a state where they're not totally purified and they're separated from God by that impurity and they cannot pray for themselves once they're dead. Only we can pray for them and they can pray for us, but they can't pray for themselves. Um, when we talk about the church, we have these descriptions of the church triumphant. Those are the saints in heaven, the church suffering. Those are the souls in purgatory and the church militant. And that's us because we're still in the battle against evil and sin here on earth. And the church militants should be praying for the church suffering so that the church suffering can become the church triumphant because we're all connected um we're a communion of saints and that's that is the communion of saints the church triumphant militant and suffering um so <clears throat> let us help commemorate them if job's sons were purified so if you read the book of job which i would recommend reading it um he was at the very beginning he's pure he's offering sacrifice for his children if Job's sons were purified by their father's sacrifice, why would we doubt that our offerings for the dead bring them some consolation? And remember, his whole family was wiped out. Um, that was in that story. Let us not hesitate to help those who have died and to offer our prayers for them. And the biggest prayer that you can offer for a dead loved one is a mass. Um, and there's actually something called Gregorian masses that are specifically to release a soul from purgatory. If you if you thought that they were in purgatory, it's a series of 30 masses um, that gets said. The anyway, any questions? So you said, well, I'll for a second. I don't know what you said. It's sorrowful. It's sorrowful to me that they don't pray for their dead. So it's yeah. Yeah. Um, that doesn't. I don't believe in parties. Yeah. As a Protestant, you right. don't believe in. Yeah. You have to contest my arguments for that. Yeah. In the past, but I, I will say this: this is a big deal for me. And yeah. I, think I, I get it. I understand why. Mm -hmm. Indulgence is a little harder, but. Um, I can remember saying, well, where, you know, when somebody died, where are they? Yeah. How do you know they're in heaven? Yeah. 
or not. So there, there's there, 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 there you, two stages. You're either in heaven or you're in heaven. Right. But how do I know which one? Yeah. And so so here's the good news of this catholic teaching to me so so we're we're told that a parent's offering for their children can get them into purgatory see the thing about the protestants and i'm not like judging or putting down because it's all about like you know your your frame of reference and how you were taught but it's usually me and jesus right and you know that you should be good to other people but with the with the Catholics, you've got this mystical body of Christ that we're all a part of it. And it includes the Protestants that are baptized in the Trinitarian formula. And so all of those Protestants who aren't being prayed for by their Protestant family, if the Catholics are offering for their the suffering souls in purgatory, guess who's praying for them? The Catholics. We're praying for them. And so it's this communion of saints where we're taking care of each other because because the idea is like it, Christ is the head of this mystical body and we are the parts of his body. And we are many parts. We are all one body, right? But if we're going to be perfected in him, then he we can't have sin on us to be like, otherwise it's like, it's like an autoimmune attack on the body like Jansen was talking about last week, right? So the more that you can understand this concept that your prayer matters. Um, there was a story and, and, you know, listen, I don't know where I don't get to judge where people go. Um, Jesus, like whenever anybody is like, are you saved? I'm like, well, I'm in the process of saving, right? Like being saved by Jesus. I don't get to decide that. That's not a judgment that, that like, I get to choose my actions, right? But then I stand before him and he he judges based on what I chose. So that's up to him to decide where I'm going, but I'm seeking heaven. Like that's my goal. And um there was a story, there's a and I think I have a slide that I'm that I am coming up, but there's a story about a woman, her name was Maria Sima, and she could see the there's she could see the suffering souls in purgatory and she knew who needed prayer and like who we, we only know some saints are in heaven because the church declared it to be so. And there's, there's saints in heaven that we don't know their names and we don't know that they're there because the church has, hasn't declared it to be so, you know, like I think my dad's in heaven, but the church hasn't declared him St. Michael green. So I can't run around and say, you know, definitively, because I don't, I don't know. Um, but Maria Sima could see these souls. So she was a mystic and there was a guy on a train and he, I think he saw her crucifix and he asked her if she was Catholic and she was like, yes. And he went off on her and he was like, I hate the church and da, 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 like they're terrible and all the things. And so she started praying for him. And he died and appeared to her and said her prayers got him to purgatory. He was not in hell because she prayed for him. That's how connected we are now. Is that doctrinal? No, it's a story of a mystic. I believe that's true, though. Like, I believe that's how connected we are. I believe that's why Job was making atonement for his children. I, this is why I pray and repair for my children, right? Because like you know everybody's sinners but and some people are way worse off than others but every prayer for them that you can make is like you're partaking in that redemptive suffering you're taking that wound that christ took on the cross and you're uniting it with him does that make sense yeah well this whole thing makes sense to me I, you know depending on where you were in the protestant world you know, if you want, it's like, okay, so I accept Christ as my Savior, I'm baptized, and boom, I'm saved. Once saved, always saved. Right. And there's another one that's, well, I might be saved, depends if I want to be elect or not. Mm -hmm. I'm say I am, because I don't want to not be. Right. So, but you never, you never really know. Right. And you don't know here either, but at least I know there's... The there's sense, a mercy. There's actually a sense of relief. In yeah. It's the greatest mercy we were ever gifted. Yes, Honest to goodness. 
<laughs> right, right. But, but there's a way the whole rest of the church, the other sacraments of the church, and reconciliation with others I haven't been a part of, but all of that is a step in getting to where a Baptist preacher will say, let me dunk you and you'll be fine. Right. And I don't believe that that's true. Right. So there's, there's, you're called to, in a matter and a form and a condition and a ritual and a belief tied up in You're this. called to a deeper love. And for most of us, it's a hard, it's hard love. It's a hard journey. Um, it's the cross. That's what, that's what true love looks like, right? It's total self giving. And so that's hard. And this means if we don't make it to that, we can still make it to heaven. That's what this means. So it's like, it's a suffering because there's a separation. And so again, when you're talking about God, who's outside of time, we describe purgatory as a place with a, how long are you going to be in purgatory? But that's, I mean, that's, we can't describe it. And so could it be an instantaneous process? I don't know. Could it feel like it's forever? I don't know. Like, I don't know, because I haven't, I mean, I'm living in purgatory right now, but like, I don't know, you know, what, what it, the, the church doesn't say much about what purgatory is like, other than that it's a suffering. And the reason it's a suffering is because there are things on your soul that are separating you from God. Yeah, and it's so different for every person. Right. That's why and the saints, the saints were like. You know, Faustina has in her diary where God was like, do you want, would you rather do your suffering on earth or one day in purgatory? So I, I imagine that when she died, it would feel like one day. And because he showed her what that was like, she chose suffering on earth. Because, because the intensity of the feeling of separation when you're dead and in purgatory is so like... At that point, you know God is real, you know love is real, and you would do anything to get to it. So the saints, you know, they, they had these mystical experiences where they knew that and they were like, oh, I'll do the suffering here. I mean, Faustina was just like, I'll, I'll offer my life for everybody, just like you, Lord, you know, and um, and he, like, the the conversations between her and Jesus, and again, private revelation, you don't have to believe it, but I do think these things take place you know jesus it, it was like he was very tender with like how much he, he he saw that she loved others you know and that like because of your heart faustina i will uh there will be sufferings for others that will be stopped you know and so thinking about that but she had a heart that was like the heart of mary the heart of jesus you know so and this is where um Purgatory is Latin for purge or cleanse. It has to do with purity. Scripture is rife with references on purification. But here we see St. Paul speak of it on the day when it becomes visible at judgment. So according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid and that foundation is jesus christ now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold silver precious stones wood hay or straw the work of each builder will become visible for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test what sort of work each has done if what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. So if you think about, I mean, Paul writes in the really long sentences with lots of commas that are running on and on, but like he's saying like the work you do in life in love, if it's golden, that's going to survive the fire, you're going to heaven. But if it's straw or hay, it's going to get burned up and burned away, right? That's, that's, 
and it's all of us will be purified by fire in the east this one this one might make your head explode um in the east they describe the purifying fire of god as like he's eternal and unchanging the people in hell are being burned by it and people in heaven are being burned by it but the people in heaven it's like a love and a passion and a zeal and a beautiful fire and the people in hell it's bitterness and resentment and anger and wrath and all those things and when the children there was an apparition in fatima portugal in 1917 where our lady appeared to three children and predicted the two world wars she showed them hell and they said the flames were coming from within them right the they could see the people and the flames were coming from within them and it was like a hatred so you're you're thinking you know we're we're seeing it as fire but like a fire of love like when you first met your spouse and that passion that you have for one another is like a beautiful all-encompassing thing that's good versus like hatred that's bad but it's the same fire it's just our response to it that's how the east describes the fire so gold is a strong foundation a gold Smith burns the gold to remove any impurity. He knows when it is finished because he can see his face in the gold. Think about that. So all that like Old Testament scripture talking about the face of God. Um, and we want to look at that's called the beatific vision. If he if you're gold and he look you, he can see himself in you. That's kind of beautiful, isn't it? Heaven is for those who die in grace and are perfectly purified. Perfect purity is different from simply being forgiven. All right. Can I have a couple of questions? Sure. I'm trying to keep them really short. Okay. Um, and I won't ask all the things going through my head because there's a lot. Yeah, I bet. But I know. I'm sorry. You're new. Hi. Let's talk to our meeting. Okay, so I guess um, the first one is more like the way, now I don't like currently identify as the Bap Southern Baptist, right. I guess, right. label that was given to me mm -hmm. when I was younger, but I was taught that nobody knows where anybody's going because it's a personal relationship with Jesus, mm -hmm. and basically the only one that knows like where you are with Jesus is you, mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. So in the Catholic church, when there's like this, I guess, methodical tradition and commitment to not only like praying for others, but also like repenting mm -hmm. and like all of that that's combined. Um, do the priests know or the people that take on those, that information know like at what level the person who passes so, so if you're asking how does the church declare someone a saint that they're in heaven, um, it the answer is like yes, the people around them would attest to their holiness, right? Um, that's part of the picture. So, so like you can tell when someone is different. When when we look at Mother Teresa and what she did in Calcutta and how she pulled pulled the dying off the streets, like nobody in india was doing that nobody and she gave them dignity in their death and she had her house for the dying and then all of a sudden all these people started converting because she didn't tell them to convert she wasn't she actually said i'm not here to convert you i'm here to love you and they converted because she loved them and her love was so different that that it took like the world was writing stories about her you know she died in 1997 and these reporters were taking note of like this I mean I'm I didn't meet her but I was probably like this far away from her on the steps of the shrine in in Washington DC and she was like this tall I mean this tiny tiny woman and I'm like and you could just see holiness like you could you could visibly it's like palpable it was like a light so yes, the testament of the people around that person would certainly be part of it. Um, but when the church actually says 
yes, they're in heaven, there's actually a prerequisite to say that. And that is that when they die, um, people have to pray for that saint's intercession. So let, let's say, you know, and this happened with Mother Teresa, they, you know, people knew she was holy and they would have some issue that was like medically impossible to get rid of or it seemingly and they would say mother Teresa, i want you to intercede and pray with me for my healing because it's our friendship that we're we're dealing with and then a healing would take place and there was no medical explanation and so for someone to be declared what is called blessed which is called a beatification one miracle has to take place it has to be investigated so, and it's scientifically investigated and for them to be canonized a saint, two miracles have to take place. Um, and so like, for example, um, Maria Goretti, uh, the, I, the two miracles for her. So she was a 11 year old girl that um, this guy, Alessandro tried to rape her and she fought him off and he stabbed her 14 times and she um she was like bleeding out and the priest came in and she was on like the hospital bed and they couldn't give her any anesthesia because because of the amount of blood coming out it would have killed her to give her anesthesia so they were trying to stitch her up while she was awake so think about the pain of that, right? And she said to the priest, I want to see Alessandro in heaven with me. So she forgave him and then she passed away. And the priest was like, this little girl was, was a saint. So people started like that story spread that this, that she like, she's on her deathbed and she's forgiving the guy that stabbed her 14 times. And so the people started praying for um, her intercession. The, and before the miracles happened, Alessandro was in prison, just a bad man for many years, but he ended up having a vision of her and she gave him 14 white lilies and he converted like on the spot and he, he ended up getting out of prison going to her mother's house and saying he was sorry and going to Christmas Eve mass with the mother, like the day he got out of prison. So radical transformations taking place. That's not the miracle though, that got her canonized. They, they were, we Catholics are weird. Sometimes we like our saints, we dig up their bodies and move them around. And there's many reasons for that, but her body was incorrupt. So that means it didn't decay. That's not counted as a miracle because they think there's many reasons that could happen. They moved her body into a church that was sinking every year. They had, they had like every year taken note of how many centimeters this church was sinking. And they were like, by X year, this church is going to have to be condemned because it's going to be, it was built on like swampy land. It stopped sinking when they put her body in the church. That was considered a miracle, number one. And then the second miracle was a construction worker that had his um, foot crushed, like bones just crushed in his um, foot. And his wife took a picture of Maria Gretti and wrapped it with all the wrappings on his foot and prayed for her intercession and when the surgeons came in the next morning the foot was completely healed and they were like looking at the x-rays and they're like this one was yesterday and his foot was crushed and this is today and they they have like medical experts that give testimony about this stuff and in in terms of the church sinking it's like the engineers being like stop sinking so then the church is like, she was so holy. So what ha what you're seeing there, it's, it's not her, it's God in her, right? The grace of God is so in her that glorious things happen. Because Jesus didn't, if you think about how he never told anybody, he wanted people, don't tell anybody I did this miracle. He never wanted the accolade for himself. Don't tell anybody. He wants to share it with us. So all this like gift of healing and all these things, he wants to share it with us. What a good God we have. How beautiful. So that is how the church declares someone a capital S saint, you know, 
Uh, small s are all the people who are there whose names we don't know. Um, today is the feast of St. Paul Miki and companions. Uh, martyrs are usually declared saints immediately by the church. That's the other way to be declared a saint where they were like, I'm dying for Christ and you know that they're dying for Christ. That's what happened with the St. Paul Miki. He was Japanese and they were like, we're going to crucify you. And he was like, okay. And they, they killed him and 14 companions with him. We don't know. All, well, we might know all of their names, but they never say all of them, but we know that they're all saints because they all died for Christ. Um, they were martyred. So those are the two ways the church has never declared anybody to be in hell um, you know, and then we, we just ask that you pray for the souls in purgatory and you can get, if y'all really want to get into this, there's really deep reading there and I'll, I'll get to it, but there's, you know, what if they're in heaven and I'm praying for them? Like what happens then, you know, and it's, the church actually has lots of answers for all of these things. And, um, I, I forget what that one's called. I'll, I'll think of it in a second, but, um, but basically the grace isn't wasted. Like God's not going to waste the grace. So, um, so what does perfect purity in a human look like? So somebody that's not God well, it looks like Mary. So, um, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God, Matthew 5, 8. So you have to think about, they will see God. Who was the first person to see God on earth? Mary. She was looking at the face of God. She was the first person to look at the face of God. And when, when, when in that first chapter of John, when it's like in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh and the word dwelt among us. And it talks about, we can see the glory of God. The first person allowed to see the face of God was the blessed Virgin Mary. She was so pure that he housed himself in her body. Um, there were three perfectly pure human persons. Adam was the first, Eve was the second, and they fell from perfect purity when they sinned in the garden. The church teaches that Mary, through the prevenient grace of Christ, was immaculately conceived in perfect purity and retained that perfect purity throughout her life. She was perfect as the heavenly father is perfect. So those of you, I'll, I'm going to repeat, a lot of you heard this in the Doctrines of Mary, but you guys are new. Prevenient grace means she was still saved by his crucifixion and death and resurrection, but God applied the grace of, of it to her before it happened because he's outside of time and he's that good and that big that he would do that for us. Um, the church teaches that Mary was praying for the Messiah and for the mother of the Messiah. And guess who God answered it for? Her. Um, and that, so it's still Christ saving. It's just that he places her in that state of perfection that Adam and Eve were in. She still had to choose to follow him. She still had to say yes, where Adam and Eve said no, and they didn't know evil. Mary, Mary could see evil. They couldn't. And so I actually think that makes it harder that she could see evil because, um, I mean, that's Susan Skinner's opinion. But if you think about the fact that in her society, women who were not married when they were betrothed, it was like this kind of engagement period. They didn't live together that first year of marriage. And then they come together if they're found to be pregnant, they're stoned to death. So when the angel is like, you know, comes to her and says, uh, you know, you're going to be with child. And she's like, how can this be in her innocence? Like, and he's like, oh, you know, the spirit will come upon you. And then she's like, yep. Okay, do it. And then she goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country instead of being like, oh, I'm going to get stoned to death. And Joseph is going to divorce me quietly. She doesn't she just trusts God, like, okay, he'll take care of it. Like, that's hard. And Adam and Eve didn't have that going on, right? So um, most other human beings would not obtain this perfection here in this life, though some may. God, only God knows that. Um, that's where St. John Bosco was like, the ones that probably do die like immediately, you know. 
Um, it looks like total and complete giving of self to God without any ulterior motive or attachment to the world or our own ego. Yeah. I, those thoughts that you have in your head about yourself all the time, Mary was thinking about other people. And it's it's not like a let people walk on you because that's not healthy. It's a, I'm going to love this person. And it's, I'm sure she had an understanding of how best to do that. You know, um, when to walk away, when to say something. Saints understand this and are willing to suffer in an order to attain their perfection here. Saints who are offered purgatory after death or suffering in this life chose suffering in this life rather than feeling any separation from God after death. It is possible to be purified on earth, but most people do not attain the perfection of the heavenly father. Hence the perfection is completed when we die. If we die in a state of grace, that's without mortal sin. Any questions? You have more, so I have to ask. The um, he descended into hell. Yep. Why? Well, where did he go there? Who was there? So we think of that word, it can be he descended to the dead. He and the scripture uses Sheol and um, another. Who do you think was there? Daniel. Daniel, Moses, you know, right. I, I would, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I will look up if I'm sure the church has somebody that wrote something on it, but the, they were separated. Remember the veil in the Holy of Holies in, in, on earth here was separating only the high priest could go in and everybody else is out there. And so it's, that kind of analogy that heaven is like that too like the wherever they were it was a holding place is the way I would describe it of waiting for the messiah um and once Jesus dies on the cross that veil is torn in two two and now all of a sudden we all have access to the holy of holies we can all receive the eucharist um through the church and her sacraments um and so that access I did I tell you my confirmation name story? I get sidetracked all the time about how my, you know, my teacher's like, you can't pick Daniel in the lion's den. And I'm like, pretty sure when Jesus descended into hell in my head that he went and got him. Yeah. So they were, there was a separation and an absence of God wherever they were, you know, think of it though, like this, God's holding everything together heaven, hell, purgatory. Like if, if God didn't, wasn't loving, we would just cease to exist. It's his love that holds us in existence. So even hell is because he's loving. The people there are not loving him and they're not loving others. Um, so wherever they were, God's holding it together from the, the outside, but that burning fire of love within that lets you know that you're in the presence of God that was not happening the best way I could describe that does that sort of make sense all right what other questions do you have okay you mentioned um one of your Two thoughts before this uh, the uh, called her hell. Yeah. Um, that I think you said something akin to um, you're separate from God in purgatory. Mm -hmm. You're aware of his presence. Mm -hmm. And that's um, always how hell was described to me. Mm -hmm. Like you, you are in the full presence of God, but you have to be there without him with you. And so I'm wondering is, is the difference then between purgatory and hell really that purgatory is temporary and hell is permanent? Um, yeah, but also hell, like the, what you're s surrounded by, I would say would be worse, you know? I mean that, well, first of all, let me just say like, again, I don't know, 
never been to any of these places and none of us can really know and we can you know watch people who have had near death experiences but even those are filtered through the lens of their experience on earth and then what they experience and what they know um but you know i, I think i actually have let me see where i am on this i have a slide at the end oh wait that was not come on oh nope 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 all right so um, at the end, there's a slide where I, uh, I liken it, and I'll just skip that slide when I get to it, to um, God's outdoor shower, <laughs> because so my parents had a house at the beach, and you would go to the beach, and you get all the sand on you, and they would want you to like wash off before you came into the house. Right. And so I, we, they had this outdoor shower that was attached to the house and, but I'm not like, I'm not in the house, but I'm attached to the house and I'm getting cleaned off. And it's like, I know the house is right there. I know the presence of the house is right there. I know my mom and dad are right inside that house, but I'm outside getting cleaned off. And that's kind of like my analogy for, for purgatory where, you know, so it's a suffering and it's a longing, but hell is like a gnashing of teeth and a like a misery. Um, no hope, right? No hope in hell, but purgatory would have hope. But you can get inside the house after your shower. Do you have another question? <laughs> oh, I, okay. I was always taught that when you they literally call them the pearly gates, which I don't know if some of y'all heard that too. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the pearly gates, they read all the things that you done mm -hmm. that you did wrong, mm -hmm. and then you forget them when you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about purgatory, would you get those those list of things that you've done wrong, the things that you haven't confessed, I guess, and have to forget Jesus first? So would, would you get that and then it'd be like, but you need to, you need to repent some more and then purgatory? Um, I, so I, again, we're like trying to put our human limits on something that's eternal and a, of God. So it, it could make, you can make your head explode if you think too much about it, but I would actually have a conversation with God and be like, I don't get this. How does this work? But I will say like from, you know, I have watched some like near death experience stuff on youtube or whatever and they they talk about their life flashing before them and they'll get shown like moments in time when they could have loved and they didn't or when they did love and like the rep re repercussions of like when they did love you know and so it it does that comes from somewhere like people have experienced that there are also people out there that have experienced hell there are people that have experienced purgatory um, and a lot of them have the same kind of things, but a lot of them are different. And I think it's because I mean, in, in terms of like, they might all say my life flashed before me like a movie scene. I've seen several of them say that. I've seen several of them say they had 360 degree vision, which I think is so cool. I'm like, that's a God's eye view, right? If you can see 360, but they might like because your relationship is personal, like, however it's experienced is going to be drawing on what you knew in life. I think there's a difference. There's one more difference in your question. There's a difference between forgiveness and punishment. Yeah. You can be forgiven. Right. But that doesn't mean you... you yeah, you still have to make restitution of temporal punishment. Right. So the purgatory is temporal punishment. Right. Even if you've already been forgiven. Right. Other so people have described it as like here are your sins. Yeah. Yes, you are forgiven, but you have to go and burning time out for this amount of time. Right. To punishment for those right go in the outdoor shower and you have to be in there for however long until all that sand is off of you or whatever i i have um 
what I'm this is just a Susan Skinner ism also not doctrinal not in the catechism but like my mom used to tell me if you dream of the dead pray for them like they're they could be in purgatory and she had a dream of a relative of hers um and in the dream all of these relatives of hers were inside the church and they were like in like the community center of the church and they were playing like bingo or something and they were having they were laughing and it was joyful and this one relative was outside the church and he was hanging on to the wall there was like a brick wall that went around the church and he was hanging on to the wall and he said to her in his dream you have to help me get in there with them. I can't make it myself. And she was like, oh, I got to pray for them there in purgatory. So, but the frame of reference for my mom, that like church with the bingo and the joviality and the community and all of that was like, you know, that's the way that God was speaking to her about it. Um, and that's, I, I had a dream um, about a priest actually. And um, I won't say who, but I was, I was in the church office. It was not this parish, just so you know. And this priest came walking, walking in, well, crawling, I should say crawling in. And he like laid down on the floor in front of me. And he's like, I can't, I'm in so much pain. I can't make it to the church. You have to help get me in the church. And I was like, I can't get you in the church. This is me. I can't get you in the church. You're like way too big. I can't carry you, you know? And he's like, no one else will help me. And in the dream, a bunch of other like Catholics and other priests walk in and see him on the floor and step over him and keep going. And I woke up and I was like, they're not praying for like these priests that were living that were, you know, aren't praying for the souls in purgatory and neither are these Catholics. And so I was like, I got to pray for this priest and um, I won't get into indulgences, but, but that's something that you can give to someone else. And that's what I ended up doing in that situation. But I had another dream about him before that. And he was like, I can't make it to my 40th anniversary party. And if you know, the number 40 in scripture is always about purification. That's how long they wandered in the desert. That's how long Jesus went out. And he's like, you have to come to the party for me to be able to get to the party. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I knew I had to pray for him. Um, but it's all my my frame of reference, right? So God's working like with what I know to get me to prompt me to do something. Um, you did it to me. So we talked about this earlier. Those who are pure in heart love God so greatly. They want nothing but a good of another person for their own sake without an ulterior motive. Scripture tells us how we treat others is how we treat Christ. This I'm not going to like read this because it's long, but it's basically when you were hungry, you gave me to eat. When you were thirsty, you gave me. And those that didn't do that, you know, um, go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And so I would ask yourself the question, what happens to those who die, who did feed and clothe the hungry, but also had the ulterior motive of wanting to be recognized in life for doing it? These are the kinds of impurities that are burned away. It's a purging of all ego of self. So the gaze of love between the father and yourself becomes like the gaze of love between the father and the son. And Mary had this gaze. So if you're like, I'm going to feed the hungry and clothe people and visit the prisoners, and then I'm going to post it all over Facebook to tell everybody how awesome I am. I'm not, I'm not, again, not judging, but like there's an ulterior motive like going on there. Um, it's not just to love, right? It's like, I want you all to love me for how awesome I am. I struggle with telling my own stories for that reason. But I also realize, like in witnessing to a story, like you're giving an example of, you know, all right, this one, the rich young man, then someone came to him and said, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. 
So the reference to the one who is good is God alone is good. And anything good we do and all goodness comes from God. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and also love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, I kept all these things. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving for he had many possessions. So my point in putting this up here is if he said, I've kept all these. Okay, I'm good. See you later. And then he gets run over by a donkey and killed. Where's he going? He was just assured of his salvation for keeping those things. But he's not perfect. So this passage like lets us know that there's two paths, right? He asks the question, like, what else do I lack? And then Jesus goes on and says, if you wish to be perfect and gives him this radical transformation, he's like, oh, no, I can't do that. That's too much. But he's already, he was actually assured in the passage of his salvation. So there's got to be a place like other than heaven that you go to when you've lived a good life. And uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux said more people convert from bad to good than from good to heroic virtue. Those good people usually end up in purgatory. The heroic virtue are the saints. Does that make sense to everybody? So again, purgatory is our greatest mercy. All right. Whoever speaks, and I talked about this in an earlier slide, a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. Um, so that was the one where we know there are things that can take place after you die. Your venial sins can be forgiven. Your temporal punishments can be taken care of in purgatory. Nothing, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So that's from Revelation 21, 27. So that reference of nothing unclean will enter it. So all of my impure motivations for doing things and all of my ego will be burned away from me before I get to heaven. Um, and I think you have to have like a docile, childlike trust of God. Like I'm, I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not good enough to be made perfect on my own. Guess why? I'm not my savior. So you have to rely on grace. And the most efficacious place is through these sacraments that the church offers. Okay. And then this just goes on to praying for the dead, some scriptural references of um, praying for the dead. So in 2 Timothy uh, 1.18, um, it says, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. <laughs> uh, name the baby Onesiphorus anyway, I'm sorry, <laughs> for he refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains, but when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me and eagerly, eagerly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you, you all you well know all the service he rem rendered at Ephesus. This is a scripture where um, he's referencing, like, he's basically saying a prayer for a guy that's died right there. Um, and then the, the last one, the, the one below it is Maccabees. It says, then under the tunic of each one of the dead, they found sacred tokens of idols of Jamnia which the law forbids the Jews to wear. And it became clear to all that this was the reason these men had fallen. So they all blessed the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge who reveals the things that are hidden. And they turned to supplication, praying that the sin that had been committed might be wholly blotted out. The no noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened as a result of the sin of those who had fallen. 
He took up a collection man by man to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead so that they might be delivered from their sins. And that's Judas Maccabees that that did that. And um, that's why like your prayers for your relatives and loved ones are so important, even if they're steeped in sin. Yes. On that, in praying for the dead, um, we went over confession, the sacrament of reconciliation. You know, the basic thing is if you die with mortal sin on your heart or on your soul, you go to hell. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my grandfather, for instance, baptist his whole life, never a very uh, righteous man. Mm -hmm. say the righteous man sent seven times a day. Right. Right. So uh, I'm going to say he died with quite a bit of mortal sin mm -hmm. on his heart. Is there any point with the praying for him? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, and and the thing is, you can't know what he knew. Um, you can't know, like, did he know all these things were grave things? Being a Baptist, maybe. Did he give his full consent? I don't know. You, you don't know. Like, there's so many things that you can't know. And the, the whole life of sin, then, right? You never <laughs> Yeah, but but it again, it's like you have to. So we need the sacraments to purify us. God does not need the sacraments. He's God, and so the the Catechism actually says, in ways unknown to us, the mercy of God could reach those who do not know Him. Or you know, so is there hope for your grandfather? I mean, could he be in hell? Uh huh. But as but could there be hope for him too? Yes. So I would be I would have a mass said for him. I'd probably have 30 masses said for him. Um, I can send you a link to Gregorian masses, but um, because you don't know. And Faustina talks about in her diary, this is the again, the head exploding greatness of God. So if you think about, and I'm sorry, we're a little over. Um, if you think about that, um, he preveniently saved Mary. So outside of time, he used the graces from the cross to say it, to make her immaculate, right? Faustina says that when you pray for somebody after they've died, that God takes your prayer from now and grace takes it back to them, like at that time of their judgment, and that grace can be used to help save them. And in particular, talks about people who have committed suicide, like praying for them and asking the Lord to take your prayer back to their time of judgment. And, um, you know, again, Susan Skinner's head, but I kind of liken it to like demons are real and they're they're they yell at us like they're loud and they tell us all kinds of things that basically like you suck and you you're worthless and or you're better than everybody else um and i just think if our we had enough prayers the voice of the communion of saints would be louder so people would turn toward god versus the demons that are screaming in their ear but we're asked to partake in it and most of us aren't praying or and I you know a lot of people pray but it's on Sunday and it's for myself and the things that I want that's how I used to be you know um but if we start praying for others and we're praying for the dead which um the holy souls in purgatory all souls day is November 2nd they say the most souls are released from purgatory on Christmas day and November 2nd is the next most souls. Um, this just goes into the roots of purgatory that th these writings have been there for ages and ages um, and about the Jews and that some, some imagine that the Ch Catholic Church has an elaborate doctrine of purgatory worked out, but there are only three essential components of the doctrine that a purification after death exists 
that it involves some kind of pain and that the purification can be assisted by the prayers and offerings by the, by the living to God. Other ideas such that purgatory is a particular place in the afterlife or that it takes time to accom accomplish our speculations rather than known. Um, let's see. It all comes from Dante's Inferno. Yeah. That's what we especially like. Yeah. And and it could be like that. You know, a lot of these writings that people wrote are are inspired from somewhere, but you don't you just don't know. Um these are just like early early so this one at the bottom from 190, the citizen Abercut Abercios, Abercios, the citizen of a prominent city. I erected this while I lived that I might have a resting place for my body. Abercios is my name, a disciple of the chaste shepherd who feeds his sheep on the mountains and in the fields, who has great eyes surve surveying everywhere, who taught me the faithful writings of life. Standing by, I, Abercios, ordered this to be inscribed. Truly, I was in my 72nd year. May everyone who is in accord with this and who understands it pray for Abercius. So he's like right there, like telling you to pray for him when he dies or when he's dead. Um, and there, this is another one from the year 160. So purgatory, the belief in it has been around for a long time. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer. I will send this video out so if you want to read these end slides at the end that's fine but it basically all of these are people that are praying for the dead there's god's outdoor shower so maria so really quick maria sima was the one i told you the guy like went off on her about the church and she prayed for him and he said he made it to purgatory because of her prayer darren ham i'll click Susan Tassoni is known as the Purgatory Lady. She's written tons of books. So if you want to read more about Purgatory, look her up. But Darren Ham um, was an atheist, like addict, like drug addict, who um, I, I just tell this story because it, it's so cool. But I'm trying to remember all the details of it because this slide is old, but his two-year-old son got the flu and um, it became apparent that he was not going to make it. This was 2009 or 10 or somewhere around there. And it became apparent that he was not going to make it. And um, they told he and his wife that the child was going to die. And, you know, he was not a believer and, um, had lived a like a horrible life and he but he was just so distraught uh about his son so he climbed into the hospital bed with his son and held him and he said this is just his experience he's like I went I went to heaven like holding my son and I met this light that was like he's like I knew it was Jesus and I knew it was all love um and like I was so he was so ashamed to be there but he was holding his son and he knew that this person Jesus was so much love that like he he desired to be there and Jesus said I can send him back with you if you would like talking about his two-year-old son and Darren said Darren oh this makes me cry he said he didn't want to take that love away from his son. So he said no and left him there. Um, and knew, like, that's how much, like, God loves us, that this father's love for his son would compel him to, like, say, yeah, take, let, let him die rather than bring him back to earth. And he changed his entire life. Um, he said the other thing that he was told was that the Eucharist was real. And so when he came back to himself, um, he went to an Episcopalian church and he's like, now that's the body and blood of Jesus. And the pastor's like, no, we don't believe that. And um, it's a symbol. And he's like, well, what's the church that doesn't believe it's a symbol? And the, the pastor said the Catholics. And he's like, okay, that's where I need to go. 
Um, and so it, the story was longer than that. You can look at his name up, Darren Ham. But I just tell that story like to, you know, it's real. And uh, um, that a father would let go of his son because that love was so great. It's like in that moment, he had more love for his son than any thought of his, himself, which actually makes him the drug addict who was an atheist, very Christ-like in that moment. So I leave you with that. Okay, and we are way over. I'm sorry. Um, let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All right, be safe. We'll get to all the rest of this out of order stuff. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, one day's time is